Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, continuing with our series on me reaching out to advisors, colleagues, people that I really respect in, in different areas. I've invited my old, oldest in duration of knowing each other, not old as in her age, friend, colleague, uh, Carla Carlson, to join me in a little conversation today. Carla is a lawyer in the Midwest and a fellow whiskey enthusiast. I don't know if I can say fellow if you're a woman. I don't know if that's, uh, if that's proper, but I don't care. Um, anyway, so this is the first Whiskey Wednesday. And to start us off, before I throw it to Carla, I have my poison glass. And I am drinking Glenfiddich Project X. And so that's what I have in my bottle. So Carla, welcome and tell us what's in your bottle. <laughs> well, thank you. In my bottle today is the 15-year-old Delwini, which is a favorite. And you'll notice that I don't need the ice. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that shot fired. And for well, a rookie, I'm... I know that you've seen in movies that you don't have ice, but what you don't know is the ice in a big format actually opens up the whiskey a little mm. bit. And so I understand in the Midwest, you guys do things a little bit differently. I'm just surprised you're not going out of the bottle. And so I think <laughs> you're a fancy lady. It's a big day today, right? <laughs> it is a big day. So I want to share the story because the story of how we met actually uh, has to do with whiskey. If I remember, I think I saw on, you know how Facebook has a thing where it, it, it gives you your memories. I think it was seven years ago. Does that seem mm -hmm. right to you? Yeah, that's about right. Okay, so we were at a conference together and I think it was like the female entrepreneurs of Saskatchewan. Yes. Was that what it was? And I gave a keynote and then I sat at your table after my keynote and there was a person on talking about, I think style, was that right? Dress for success. She was teaching us all how to properly place a scarf. <laughs> Which was interesting because as I remember, everyone in, in uh, Saskatoon was wearing denim and kind of like burlap <laughs> kind of chaps. And so you'd think you guys would have taken it. It was unnecessary. I thought you guys would have taken that seriously. But instead you said, hey, let's go get a whiskey. Which yeah. both excited and offended me at the same time. Because nobody had ever offered to go for a whiskey in the middle of a conference. And long story short, I think we became friends about three minutes in, no? Yeah, it was exactly like that. The best part was, of course, walking out of the conference with the keynote speaker to go have a scotch in the in the lobby of the bar across the street, which maybe was frowned upon by the organizers, but I saw it as a big win. <laughs> I, I, I saw it as a win. Cheers to us. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so maybe um, before we get started, because I want to talk a little bit about your book, Everyday Grace, uh, which has actually become a favorite of mine. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about your background. So, you know, in today's world, you're, you know, an accomplished and respected lawyer in Swift Current. You work in a, you have a family law practice. Um, you know, I, I know lots of people who know the firm and speak nothing but, you know, great things about it. But you didn't actually start off as a lawyer. And in the book, you kind of, you share experiences throughout your career. And so maybe you can kind of start us back to kind of that social work phase right around there and then catch us up to how you how you became the lawyer you are today. Sure. So yeah, I, I got my social work degree and was practicing up in, in uh, the northern parts of the country uh, doing social work. So very um, intense practice uh, as a social worker working primarily in child protection. Um, so worked with a wide variety of families. Um, we were in a military community, so there was all kinds of um, interesting issues there. Uh, we had um, uh, several uh, reserves in our area, so there was some interesting issues there. We were in an oil field community, so some stuff going on there. So like really varied experience working with just a very broad number of families. Um, and so I, best training ever, right? Because you have to learn to go quickly and fly on your feet and make decisions um, in the best interest of these kids and for these families. Um, and so that's what I did. And my first job as a social worker, I actually lived with families that had uh, kids at high risk for abuse. And my job was to build a relationship with the parents and try and help them to overcome some of their challenges and, 
and, and give them parenting skills. Keeping in mind, I was 20 years old at the time. Uh, so I'm not sure what my parenting skills were, but uh, there was a lot of learning by all of us. And for me, really learning how to work with people to understand what their challenges were uh, and to build relationships on a very different level in, in a time where they obviously, when I first knocked on the door, they weren't uh, real keen for my arrival. So, you know, that's where I got started uh, in my relationship building practice as a business person, if you will, uh, and carried on from there. So question, when you were a social worker being placed with those families, were you kind of like, like court kind of court ordered to be in yes. there? Like how did, how were you, how were you allowed to be in there? The court order that you had to be in? Yeah. So either we were in there by a court order or by a consent uh, arrangement where they'd entered into an agreement with the ministry uh, to allow us to be in there. And we would work 24 hour shifts on a rotation with these families. And obviously it was the alternative to uh, removing the children. So in my view, as a social worker, it was a wonderful program, uh, kept kids at home, taught people skills, uh, brought families together. And if we were successful, created connection. And I mean, there could be no greater service, right? Uh, and so it was a wonderful program that I was part of and uh, incredible learning um, to move from people not wanting to answer the door to hugs uh, at the end of the day, right? I mean, it took a long time to get there sometimes, but uh, we saw some incredible movement with families. So um, really powerful experiences. Well, one of your stories that I, I like is you talk about you, the advice you were given never to take your shoes off. Mm -hmm. And so can you say a little bit about that? Cause that's one of my, that's one of the stories where I'm, when you told me that. So maybe share a little bit why that advice was pertinent. Well, I was being, it was actually the very first home that I was being placed in. Uh, and when I met with the social worker who was in charge of the file, she uh, sat down to give me very brief instructions. It was actually over the phone. And uh, she basically gave me the rundown on the family. And basically there had been a very significant assault the night before. The mom had actually stabbed um, the husband in the home. And so they needed to get people in there very soon to make sure that everyone, I mean, the dad was obviously removed, but uh, just to deal with the trauma, the kids were present when all this occurred. So they wanted to move us in quickly. So I was going in first right away. Uh, and she basically just said, listen, mom's not real happy that you're coming. You're gonna be facing a number of challenges. Oh, and keep your shoes on. Um, maybe I'm dating myself, but uh, the pay phone is across the street, carry a quarter, you might need to run and get help. Like we're not sure what you're exactly gonna be facing. So um, a lot of fear in that moment, but uh, we did a lot of great work with that family, so. Wow, and so how did the transition happen from social worker to lawyer? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with my personality, but also I just felt like I wasn't able to impact the kind of change that I wanted to make. Uh, and so I, you know, was finding myself in court a great deal. I was working with a lot of lawyers. My dad, of course, is a lawyer. And so I was influenced just, uh, by lawyers growing up. And I just felt that um, I would have maybe a greater impact um, on a broader scale. Uh, in the kinds of ways that I wanted to uh, if I moved into a law practice. And so that's where that all came from. How long were you a social worker? And then and then how long have you been to call, like how long have you been called as a lawyer now? Yeah, so I practiced social work for about three and a half years, which feels like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, then after that, I, I've been, I was called to the bar in 2002. So, um, mm -hmm. so I've been practicing for a fair chunk of time now. 18 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, have, have a sip of whiskey. I feel weird. You're talking and I'm having a little sip. This is, I like <laughs> this. I like how we're sharing the workload. Yeah. <laughs> and so you advocated for now kind of, you advocated for end of life, end of life. Like what, what's the proper term for that? Because I always Pied mess it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, palliative so, care. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So uh, my mom died very suddenly from cancer and through that process there was no palliative care available here in our community mm. uh, and so from diagnosis to death was five five weeks for my mom uh, and it was very traumatic change and also she wanted to die at home so as a social worker and a lawyer of course did research learned everything i could and basically put together a palliative care program for my mom 
uh, with our own family and our resources here in our community. So following on that, once I was ready, I knew again, it was time that I needed to get involved. And so I very actively got involved in the palliative care community, not only in our community, but in our province. And then I was served on the national board for a number of years. Uh, and I still work with them at the national level, just trying to improve palliative care for all Canadians. Nice. And so was there, did you get any recognition for that work? <laughs> well, yes, Chris, and I know you just love this award, uh, but I did receive the Queen's Medal for my work uh, in palliative care uh, across the country, as well as locally and provincially. So that was and I, awesome. I love yours. Well, you're so humble about it, and I love it. So I love to poke <laughs> you and get you to bring it up every time because I see you get a little cringy, like, oh, me. And so I love it. Well, okay, I, what so, I would prefer is to see palliative care a little more high on the profile list, but anyways. No, I'll well, take ho hopefully with our aging community that we start to put more money into that and into veterans, we, uh, we can do better in Canada for sure. So let's kind of move on to the current situation. So you wrote Everyday Grace, has it been two years? Two plus years. Uh, 20, I think 2017. 2016. 2016. 2016. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, uh, I shared with you a story. I have a friend who is uh, struggling at work. He's in a, a high stress job. He is a very macho, macho guy. Uh, one of my dearest and oldest friends from university. And I sent him a copy of your book because your book is filled with stories that I think, I think people are shocked at how many stories that they connect with in this book. And I, I know that you've seen that as a speaker and, and speaking to a variety of audiences. But anyway, I sent him the book. And what I found interesting is, you know, the, the macho Kamloops thing is like, like, what's this? Like, I don't read this. Send me something on bow hunting. <laughs> and uh, long story short, he got into it and now he carries the book so that when he's having a rough day and like, you, I mean, you know, the industry is in a high stress kind of like, I, I guess, like social work insofar as you're dealing with people at their worst. Mm -hmm. And this book is something that he pulls out and he just randomly will read a story to kind of to get himself centered or I, I guess back to, you know, what's important for him right now. And so mm -hmm. I'd like you to give a little bit of background on kind of where the book came from, right? So where, like, did you collect these stories? Did you just have a lot of stories? I mean, all the stories are great. I know you had a challenge figuring in what order to put them in because they're great. But mm -hmm. so tell me why getting these stories up was important to you. Well, you know, I think for a number of reasons. First of all, I think the stories in the book are stories that need to be told. They're, they're stories that, um, like you said, everybody connects with. And particularly, I was graced to hear these stories or be part of them. And I just felt like they couldn't end with me. Um, that these are stories that are incredibly powerful on a very human level and can just really uh, help people in their challenges, in their everyday, to move through things that are very common experiences. So much of the, all of the book really is stories of, of things that we all experience. We experience loss and grief. We experience um, all kinds of challenges. We lose our perspective. Um, uh, we forget what's important, um, you know, and also we don't get recognized in the way that we want to or whatever, you know, those are the kinds of topics that are contained in the book. And these stories that are connected to the topics, I feel, they, they very much resonated with me, but they also really resonate with so many different people because they're common experiences. And I think there's a comfort in reading those stories to recognize, hey, this isn't just happening to me. I mean, we're all gonna lose our mom someday. Um, we're all gonna feel like we're not being properly recognized by our partners. We're all gonna suffer business loss. Uh, you know, that happens to everyone. These are common experiences. And that's why I think the book doesn't matter if you're the CEO or or the uh, you know the front the front door staff. It it's it's a common experience to everyone's life, and so as a result, the book really um, has resonated with people. And um, and I've heard some amazing stories in terms of these stories have now built more stories. That other people are sharing their you know, their paths and their challenges and, and it's really opening a door to dialogue and conversation, which is incredibly powerful. What well, do you find interesting now that I, like, it seems to me that this is, this is the first time since maybe World War II, where almost every human on the planet is having a similar experience. For now, they might, they're, 
the response to that experience might be different, but mm -hmm. you know, you know, you have the Western kind of the world that, that actually always does quite well. You have the African communities that often do really poorly, but the whole world is struggling with uh, Corona, right? Or the COVID mm -hmm. crisis. And I, I think like a book like this it tends to be one that people are much more even, even more open to reading right now because I, I don't know if you've been seeing on the media, I've been watching Canadian US media, uh, mental illness is going through the roof because people yes. are having a hard time with the isolation, right? Their you know, spouses are fighting, kids are fighting with family, with parents, parents have given up on homeschooling. Thankfully, I'm married to someone who likes that stuff because my mm -hmm. children would also be, I don't know, hand tying fishing nets or something. Uh, but it seems like the world now is, is kind of craving intimacy. They're craving that common, you know, that common experience of, you know, I'm hurting and it's good to hear that you're hurting too. And I know that sounds weird, but mm -hmm. I, I, it's good that I'm not kind of all alone. And so wouldn't you agree that kind of the, these types of stories are, are almost a precursor, uh, a primer for people to share, share stories they might other, in otherwise environments be uncomfortable with. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things COVID has done for all of us has caused us to pause, right? We all have really stopped in our tracks and had to step back and reflect on uh, all kinds of things from our businesses to our finances, to our families, to our connections with the outside world, to our friends, um, all of those pieces. And in that pause time, many people are choosing to reflect and decide what's important and what's not important. And, and, and some of that is really painful for a lot of people. It's bringing up grief and loss and, and mental health struggles and, and maybe an awareness of things not being maybe where they need to be. And, and I do think there's a comfort in knowing that you're not struggling with that alone, whether it's in your business or your personal life. Lots of people are struggling with that right now. And I think acknowledging that in this time of reflection, you do have the power to make choices to change, regardless of where you're at in your life. And regardless of how big or small that change may be, it's possible, right? And I think that gives people hope. Even in this COVID world where we're so uncertain about where we're going, people need to know that good can come of this. Um, and despite the tremendous loss that we're suffering in so many ways, we can choose to do something with that. Uh, and that's powerful, right? That's really powerful for people. What and I, I think that's what Everyday Grace is, right? That's your power. When I, you know, I, I think about the, the title Everyday Grace and, you know, my wife who, you know, uh, was teasing me because she's like, you seem to be in a good mood every day of this, you know, everyone else not in a good mood, like you're in a good mood. It's like you're thriving on the chaos. But to your point, I think because I did that Camino last summer, right, where I spent a month by myself, you know, basically in a foreign country. And those first 10 days, I mean, you and I chatted all through the summer. But those first 10 days, at the end of the 10 days, she said to me, what's the, you know, what's the biggest thing you learned? And I'm like, oh, that I don't like myself very much. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I don't really like myself. If I, if I wasn't me, I wouldn't be my friend. Mm -hmm. And she's like, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's not what I was expecting you would say. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's the challenge with being alone with your thoughts 14 hours a day for 10 days is you can't run from the problem. And you and I know, I mean, you and I have, I mean, we live in different parts of the country, but, you know, we have similarly busy lives and, you know, get up in the morning, get the kids off to school, go to the gym, go to work, manage clients, prospect, you know, do your paperwork. Like we're, we're constantly busy. And so even when an idea comes up, maybe you thinking about your mom or me thinking about my dad, that might get five minutes and then you quickly prep for breakfast or take the dog out or, mm -hmm. and I think the benefit I had last summer, which is probably why I'm well prepared for now as I work through a bunch of those demons, mm -hmm. is a lot of people that are stuck at home are now facing what I faced, but they don't have the benefit of being alone, right? They might have those family members where they still have to put on that face and act like everything's okay, even though they feel like they're breaking apart. Exactly, exactly. And so they don't have maybe the connection or the support that they think they need to get through it, but actually they do. Uh, and it's all there. They just need to take some time to figure that out and work through some of those processes, which for a lot of people can be really difficult. I mean, dealing with loss and grief and all of those pieces uh, has a profound impact on how we see our day and our relationships with others and our businesses and all of that. 
Um, and so taking this time uh, to reflect on some of that and choosing to use um, some of those experiences, those stories, if you will, in maybe a different way can be pretty powerful. Right. Well, we have a friend from high school who was on Facebook and she, I mean, she's a pretty strong character. And she basically came out and said, like, I, I, I don't know where I'm going to feed myself next month and I can't pay my rent. Yeah. And, 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 and she put it out there really vulnerably, which I, I was impressed by. And so I instant messenger and I, I guess about 30 of our grad class actually reached out and said, Hey, let us, let us help out next month. Mm -hmm. And the emotion she had over that kind of engagement, but to your point, kind of having that conversation and she said, I will absolutely take you up on it and I will pay you back. And in the time I'm not working, I'll volunteer in my community. Mm -hmm. And so pretty magical, right? Because I don't, I don't, you know, I probably have the time. I don't make the time to volunteer, right? I prefer mm -hmm. just to write, write a check. I know that makes me a bad person, but I'm not even mad. Um, <laughs> knowing that she, you know, she's going to be out active in the community. I feel like I'm inadvertently supporting good, good deeds. Well, and, and the act of service is, is probably the most gratifying and life changing act that there is, right? right. Uh, giving of yourself, whatever that looks like, uh, in whatever form that is. Um, can be incredibly powerful. And I think so much of that is happening right now that that too is causing people to realize and reframe what's important, right? Uh, and and they're doing it with their kids. And I mean, you, you hear about it every day, you open your phone and it's like people are sewing masks or they're right. giving elastics or they're these the wine ninjas in Alberta, I, that's spreading across Western Canada, that's all happening. And just these little pieces, you know, the hearts in the window, whatever it is, these acts of service, this give back. To, um, I mean, I just think that contributes to all of our better well-being. Well, I wonder how we come out of this, right? Like, I wonder if it's, it's kind of like New Yorkers, you know, post 9-11, pre 9-11. And so I wasn't in New York until after 9-11. But people said that that community, you know, that 24 million people that work in the city, it almost shifted overnight, because that, that to them, right, what, what Corona is, you know, in a way to all of us, that was a common experience of all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. And rather than pushing each other to get on the subway, they made sure that everybody got on the subway. And I wonder if we come out of this with a renewed kind of response that our parents had, you know, after I remember my dad talking about the Great War, right, World War Two, mm -hmm. I guess not the Great War the, it's the first one, but the second one, him saying, you know, people, even though they didn't have anything, they shared with each other, right? Like, because they were all on rations, even Canadians, mm -hmm. right? Canadians mm -hmm. were on ration. And if you knew that your aunt was baking, you would take this week's ration of butter and bring it over to her, right? And that's still a prairie. I mean, that's a prairie mindset as well. That really hasn't, I mean, in the bigger cities, it's dissolved. But when you go to the Maritimes or even the prairies, you know, that that there seems to be a little more of a generous helping of kindness that mm -hmm. have left in the prairies and the, and the Maritimes. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I always tell the story um, of uh, when I, we were in Las Vegas uh, during the shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next day, uh, it took us all night to get home. We were stuck where we were and we couldn't get back. And our were hotel was very close. We were weren't at, at the, the concert, concert. Oh, thank God. but we were in a different hotel at the time and there was, it's a long story, but there was lots of chaos as you can imagine. And by the time we, we didn't even know what was happening. We couldn't get any information. And uh, anyways, by the time we got back to our hotel, our hotel had become a, like a trauma unit. They, there was people there and they were laying in the lobby. And it was only at that point at about 4.30 in the morning that we were actually learning what had occurred. We didn't actually know. We had to catch a flight that next morning. We had to be at the airport by eight o'clock. And we went up to our room uh, and tried to catch a little bit of sleep. And of course you're all wound up and, and not really sure what's gonna happen. So we head down to the lobby to go get our, try to get to the airport to see if we can get home. And I, you know, when I tell this story, I say, you know, it was the most profound experience because people had completely changed. I mean, somebody held the elevator door for me. There was a man there that, like, do you need a bottle of water? Um, there was all kinds of people trying to get to the airport. Everybody was like, what time's your flight? What time's your flight? Let's make sure we get the people there that need to go first because there was no cabs left in Vegas, right? Right. And just the entire, I mean, it was a very surreal experience because it was Vegas. I mean, you don't normally experience a whole lot of kindness in Vegas, right? And it was absolutely profound. And it was like everybody just stopped 
and went, wait a minute, we need to take care of each other, right? Mm. And that's what I think is happening with COVID. Everybody's realizing we're in this together and we need to take care of each other. And we need to make sure that we're doing what matters, right? We need to wash our hands and all the important things that we have to do. And so it's making people step back and reframe. And so what I'm hoping is that that translates into business and life where we all recognize that these relationships are ser- are super important and we need to step back from the transactional practices maybe that we've been doing and make sure we're taking care of our business partners and the people that we deal with on a regular basis and that we do good business together right well, well that's the japanese business model that i love is that don't do business with anyone you wouldn't do business with for 30 years And so you invest in the relationship and it's not just transactional, right? There could Mm -hmm. be a transaction part to it. But I always say like, I only want to do business with people. I let babysit my kids. Mm -hmm. So if I don't trust you enough to leave the, you know, the people I love the most and vice versa for anybody that I do business with, regardless, partner, client, whatever, I want to be their first phone call is if they're Mm -hmm. in trouble, I am the person that I want them to feel most confident in being able to come up with a solution. And because you give a shit. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so what I'm kind of, and I know your time is tight, but one thing I want to kind of sneak in here is what I think you've done really well. And I'd love some insight on is you have brought in, especially during this time, kind of pieces of everyday grace into your practice. So you have, uh, so how many employees do you have? I have six. You have six employees and then your dad and you are, are the practicing attorneys. Right. And so talk to me about how your practicing that grace internally, because I know that you're, you're checking in with the staff and kind of having conversations to make sure that people are like, they're doing all right, given the situation. Mm-hmm. So what's your mindset? Cause I think that's helpful. Even for me, I don't think that way. Right. Like I think, okay, it's, it's gold rush, right? We, we do good in down markets, everybody hunt, hunt, hunt. <laughs> and after you and I talked last time, I'm like, I'm, I'm not doing a good job at checking in to see how people are doing. Cause I assume everyone's doing as great as I am, right? Like I'm, I'm loving this. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I don't love the illness part, but I love, I love a corrective nature of a market shift. Mm-hmm. And so how do you approach making sure that your team is, you know, there's grace in the, in the workplace. Like one of the things you shared, which shocked me last time we chatted <laughs> was that people weren't allowed to eat lunch at their desk. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's pretty, that's pretty outside the box culturally especially in a busy law firm to, because you said, is it your dad or you go home for lunch every day? The whole staff, everybody goes home for lunch. Okay, uh, so talk, talk that <laughs> through a little bit because it blows my mind. That, that blows my mind. Well, because you got to eat, Chris. <laughs> I know, but, right? when I worked, but when I worked in the corporate world, I mean, even though you're a business owner, your environment is a corporate one. Yes. I don't, unless I was out for a client lunch, I had lunch at my, I had breakfast, lunch, and most nights dinner at my desk. And mm-hmm. so talk to me about why, why that's important, because you're obviously getting the benefit, like the employees, you're getting the benefit of the activity. Mm-hmm. Tell, me, tell me why that's important to the firm and, and other things that you might be doing to keep people connected right now. Well, I think, you know, you, you, we treat our staff like they're our family, right? And so their families are as important to us as they are, right? Uh, to them. And so we try to implement all kinds of things to make sure that their families are um, at the top of the pile, right? And so going home for lunch allows, um, uh, I have a lot of women that work for me, allows them to throw in a load of laundry and prep supper. Uh, Sometimes it gives them that hour of downtime that they're not going to get when their kids are at school. Obviously, everybody's kids are home now, but I mean, normally that would be the case. So closing the door for that hour and allows, allowing my staff to just, of course, we live in a small community, they can all be home in five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, allows them to shut this off and turn that on for a little bit of their day. It changes their whole pattern of thinking. And honestly, our productivity is higher as a result because when they get back, they're ready to focus on my things and they can deal with their things over the lunch hour. Sometimes they're doing quick appointments or they're running to the school to do a meeting with their teacher or whatever, but they know that they have that time every day. So I think, you know, when you, when you care about your staff as if they're your own family and you think about them that way, then implementing those kinds of things isn't hard to do. And, you know, it just makes sure that they're taken care of, that their needs are taken care of. We do everything on flex time. Uh, so if they need, you know, if they need to do appointments, they can go and do appointments. 
Um, and they just give me that time back later. We've never ever had a staff not be more generous with us um, than we are with them. They always give back more, it's incredible. Um, you know, we do team meetings very regularly right now just to check in. I mean, I wanna know how are your kids coping at home? Uh, I've sent computers home from the office for their kids if they don't have facilities to be able to, um, you know, do their uh, schoolwork, schoolwork at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, we offered my own kids are teenagers. Um, there was some transition time where some of my staff weren't able to get things lined up. We offered our own kids uh, as babysitters to them uh, to make sure that their kids would be taken care of with a, a trusted babysitter until they could get their own pieces lined up. So, I mean, I think all of those little things go a long way to creating a really solid environment and making sure our people are taken care of. Because if they're not taken care of, if they're worried about other things, then they can't focus on what I need them to focus on, which is doing the best service to clients, right? So. Right. How many, so how often are you having staff meetings get together? Is you have them like once a month or a couple times a month? Like twice, are you having, a, twice a month, yep. And is that so, regular or is it just because of the current situation? No, nope, we do that uh, every two weeks, always. Uh, we get together whether we have stuff to do or not. Um, I've created all kinds of games, especially when we have new staff so that we can get them up to speed faster. We play trivia games and do different things that we've created as a team um scavenger hunts things like that in the office and so that they can learn where stuff is and try and keep it fun um it seems like a very strange environment for a law firm especially a corporate law firm but uh, it works and i have some of the best people in the world working for me as a result okay and so for you as a leader now there's got to be times i would assume were high stress right so you have high volume or, or all of that stuff how do you how do you incorporate this into your day or your planning when you come in and like, geez, you know, we are in the weeds, right? We have a ton of work to get done, short time frame. I mean, I know what clients are like you do too, is, you know, need it yesterday and mm -hmm. their emergency becomes your emergency. How do you introduce grace into the workplace kind of when things are, are frantic or people might be feeling stressed out? Like, is there any, any little things that you're thinking about or approaches that you go to to kind of bring, bring the level down and get people calm? Well, I think, I think if you come from an environment of everyday grace, then the tools are there at your disposal, right? Mm -hmm. So when those rough patches hit, when you're getting slammed with work, we talk about perspective. We talk about priorities. Um, we have all the tools in place because we've had all those conversations. We rally as a team. Uh, that's when the comedic nature of the firm really comes together. Uh, we make sure everybody's taken care of. Nobody leaves for the day or starts their day without me reviewing their desk so that I know exactly what they have for the day, help them adjust their priorities. And we look at that in the morning, we look at it at the end of the day, we make sure all of our clients are taken care of that need to. And as a team, we pull together so that nobody's too worried about any one thing, right? So we move, the, we shift the work around. Everybody's trained on everything so that I don't just have one paralegal that's able to do things. So with the foundation of everyday grace being service, let's take care of each other, let's make sure we're okay, let's make good choices, let's have perspective, we're gonna get through this. I think with that foundation continued into business, um, it creates great success with your team. And the clients, the clients feel appreciated and acknowledged, um, and they know that everybody's trying, and so then people, um, you know, they're accepting of whatever the process ends up looking like. Well, I have to imagine too, if you have that graceful, like not just introducing grace, but it just being an environment of grace, mm -hmm. that even with staff are having conflict, maybe with each other or on a file or at home, you know, something, you know, kids are acting up or something. There's probably a higher comfort level to come to you with a problem and yeah. not feel like you're going to be the dragon lady. Because I know I, 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 I probably still have a bit of that reputation is, you know, I don't want to hear problems. I want to hear solutions, which is very old school dickish, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you guys, I'm too busy to deal with your BS. Mm -hmm. But truthfully, as you and I have talked, you know, I've thought, you know, I wonder if I could get more out of them with a slightly softer hand. But I know that some are nervous mm -hmm. to come talk to me when things aren't going well, where it, it sounds like a, that graceful environment would be, you know, we're in this together. And if you have a problem, I'm happy to, to talk it through with you and try to come up with a solution with you. Is that, is that how it plays? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to troubleshoot it out and we're going to work together as a team. And if it's a personal problem, then obviously that doesn't impact the rest of the team in the same way. But if it's a, if it's a, you're not understanding how to work through a file, 
it's amazing how everyone will jump in and pull pieces to make sure that we are successful. Um, and then we all celebrate the success, which is another thing that I talk about in my book is I think, you know, so often we don't take time to appreciate what we've done well and pat ourselves on the back and, and recognize that we've done a good job, you know, in the, in the chaos of the, of the day when it's super busy, when you have a win, our firm stops and we, we actually have a wall where we celebrate it. Like we keep records of different things, comments, clients, comments, so that people can remember that we're doing good work here. Right. Let's just right. keep going. Right. Well, you know, I think that that's, uh, I, I think that's the key that a lot of us are going to struggle with is, is changing that mindset of like the family, right? Like, cause I, I always think of clients as family, but I don't necessarily think of the team's family and which is kind of an odd, like, as you talk about, I'm like, oh, I got to get more of my shite together. But so with that, with that fundamental kind of default setting of let's have a graceful situation, let's treat each other with grace rather than judgment, which is where I normally default to making a quick judgment about what's going on. It seems like you're seeing the success of, of creating that, not, no, not just injecting it, but kind of that seems to be the DNA. Now, did you get that from your dad, from your mom, from your experience? Like, I hate to even say this to you because I know that this, you, this will repeat. You'll probably clip this part of the video and play it back every time we talk. But how did you, how did you get so smart on this, like on this particular secret sauce? Where, like, did you, who did you learn it from? Did you come up with it by accident? How, like, how does it happen? I think it's a whole combination of a great number of people that I worked with, right? You know, from my beginnings as a child welfare worker, I had an unbelievable supervisor who made sure we were recognizing success and took care of that team because we were in, un, you can imagine the situations we were placed in, uh, pretty stressful. And I was very young at the time. Uh, so she was an incredibly powerful supervisor. Some things I loved, some things I didn't, took the good, left the bad, moved on, right? My dad, uh, an incredible lawyer, uh, has generations of clients that he's been working for, a very loyal following, um, has, uh, you know, the paralegal that we have here has been with him uh, for almost 30 years. You know, it's an incredible retention and there's a reason for that. So again, take the good, leave some of the bad and, and move on, right? And so I think you you build from all that stuff. And this is where I talk about choices. I think we have choices of how we're going to use our experiences. And when you actually reflect and see those things and go, Hey, that's a pretty good idea. Then don't stop there. You have to make the choice to actually do it. And once right. you start, you'll feel the reward of it or not. You'll tweak it. Maybe it doesn't work in your environment, but I think uh, you have to try. And I think so many people just go, you know, they'll read a business book or a different, and they'll, oh, that's, that's awesome. But I don't work in downtown Toronto, so I can't do that. Or that would never work here because I have this, you know, they find all the reasons why they can't. Right. Um, we have to make choices of why we can and why it's better because it's, it's a great way to work. Right. Well, it was, you made me nervous there for a second because when you said you take the good, you take the bad, you know where <laughs> I thought you were going, right? <laughs> Well, you get all kinds of advice, Chris. <laughs> no, but I thought you were going to go, you take the good, you take the bad, you take it all in there, you have the... Facts of life, yes. <laughs> oh, you didn't even sing it. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. Wow, that whiskey... I didn't, didn't know this was karaoke Whiskey Wednesday. <laughs> hey, listen, this is the first Whiskey Wednesday, so we're totally just free-balling it, okay? I haven't had enough whiskey to start singing yet. <laughs> let's see your glass. Let's see your glass. You, uh... Oh, rookie. Is that a shot glass? No, it's a whiskey glass. So fancy. Wow. wow. You won that at the spittoon for the, for the farthest <laughs> watermelon seed. <laughs> okay, listen, I know that your time is tight. So thank you for joining us. What I, I like to offer on these. So first thing I'm going to do is we're going to do a giveaway. So the 10th person that emails me, just random the 10th, will get a copy of Carla's book that I will send off to you. Uh, what I invite my guests to do is if somebody has a question, they can either email me or they can put it in the comment section in the video below and you might be open to answering it. Uh, on top of that, you're a speaker, so I'll put some information down. I know that we've talked about going on tour together. However, I think that's a terrible idea <laughs> because I feel like 
like I would make you look more angelic and you would make me look more Satan-esque. <laughs> so I would get sent to hell and you would probably get another Queen's Jubilee medallion, red sapphire. It is what it is, Chris. <laughs> could I wear, could I wear your jewel on stage? <laughs> We'll Look, you're so protective. You're like, no, it doesn't come out of the safe unless state <laughs> dignitaries are coming to Swift Current. Exactly. Anyway, okay. So everybody, thank you for watching. Thank you, Carla, for joining us. If you have questions, like I said, put them in the comments below. We'll do our best to answer them. Remember that in this environment, gladiators eat first, so you have to go get after it. But to Carla's point, do everything you are with grace. This is the environment to really show people that you actually care more than just the transaction you want to be doing business with people for 30 years and care for people who need a little bit of love or can't care for themselves. Now that's time for you to step up. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.